Hi, this is Jeremy from Helio, and I'm here with Nick Riggle, a former hey. pro skater turned uh, professor of philosophy at the University of San Diego. And uh, Nick, you've got a brand new book out called On Being Awesome. Yeah. A, uh, a, yeah. Oh, we both got one. Perfect. Book high five. Boom, book high five. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that has never happened before. This is already going to be <laughs> like the ideal interview. Um, but this is a unified theory of how not to suck. It is all about yeah. awesomeness. Um, mm -hmm. So first of all, Nick, thank you so much for joining me. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course, of course. Um, so of all the topics that I imagine philosophers tackling late at night, um, awesomeness is not usually one of them. And yet, right. <laughs> I, I think if somebody is qualified to talk about it, it's definitely you with your pro skating oh. <laughs> background and everything. Thanks. So, yeah. um, so I guess my first question is, how did this book even come about? Yeah, um, good. It's um, So... It does seem like an unusual topic in a lot of ways, but um, there's a there's a tradition in in philosophy, uh, which if you sort of make the tradition explicit, um, uh, makes it seem less unusual to to take up a topic like this. Hmm. So um, it really goes all the way back to Socrates, who was running around in the in the in the you know town square, asking people what they meant by various terms that were really important. To them in their lives, hmm. so piety or um, uh, self-control, stuff like that. Um, and he would actually people who were going to the courtroom to um, accuse their father of piety. He would ask them, "Well, what do you mean by?" Or sorry, of impiety. Hmm. He would ask them, "What do you mean by by piety?" I mean, such that you're so confident that um, you should act on your judgment that your father is impious. Hmm. Um, and so that was a, and that would get them to reflect on what their values were, whether they were living correctly and mm -hmm. also, you know, reflect on the culture they were in such that piety had this importance to them. And, um, <clears throat> so, so doing that kind of thing, uh, is, is sort of the bread and butter of a certain tradition of philosophy. Mm. That's really what's going on in this book. And, um, but the book also taps into a, um, kind of an emerging genre of philosophy book uh, that started with a Harry Frankfurt's book called On Bullshit, mm, where, yep. <laughs> yeah, so where he's just like, wow, we have this term and everyone seems to use it um, in a certain way and they understand what they mean, but uh, what do they really mean? You know, what is bullshit? It's, right. not, it's not that you're lying. It's not that you're telling the truth. It's something, something else. Something else. It's bullshit. <laughs> it's bullshit, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> So he, he has a nice little, uh, it was an essay that got you know, printed as a nice little book. Mm -hmm. And then there's another book, which I cite in, in On Being Awesome, uh, called Assholes, A Theory by right. Aaron James, where he does the same thing. He's like, look, we have this term asshole. Like, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's sort of fair game for a philosopher to come in and be like, what do we really mean by this? Does it yeah. mean anything? Or is it just like a expressive term? Or yeah. is there something deeper behind it? And, you know, the answer could be, no, there's nothing deeper or... Actually, it's an interesting term that the investigation of which reveals like deep things about our culture. And and so that's the approach I'm taking in, in this book. Uh, the thought being, you know, if you're alive today uh, in the West, you're going to hear, especially uh, American influenced Western culture, you're going to hear people saying that's awesome or that sucks. Right. And, um, you know, it's not clear uh, on uh, immediate reflection uh, what we mean by that mm -hmm. it seems it seems clear that what we don't mean is that those things are awe inspiring right, right. we're not just using it in its literal traditional sense yeah. um, and so the question I, I i raise in the book is is there something deeper behind it and and i articulate uh, a kind of new meaning mm. that makes clear what awesomeness is and then clarifies its uh, relationship to suckiness which um i argue uh you know they're they're actually antonyms in our in our contemporary on the contemporary tongue. So right, right. Yeah. Well, I mean, well, after finishing the book, I was certainly convinced. I, I, I really oh, did. <laughs> yeah, I, I did. I did yeah. love it. I really did. I mean, I wouldn't oh, be great. doing this interview if I didn't. Right. <laughs> but um, but yeah, okay. So so there is something deeper behind what we say when we say awesome and when we say that sucks. Um, yeah. So what exactly is that? You know, what is awesomeness yeah. under this uh, this new paradigm? So uh, what I argue in the book, roughly, is that. Um, uh, being awesome is a matter of being good at creating what I call social openings. Mm. Um, so social openings occur when um, we sort of break out of our roles and routines and norms uh, to express ourselves in a mm. certain way that gets other people to express themselves as individuals mm. and where the result is this kind of mutually appreciative community of individuals. Mm. So let me give you an example. 
um, one I use in the book a lot is um, sort of an everyday experience that, that we have uh, of like ordering coffee in a cafe. Right. So normally when you order a coffee in a cafe, um, you enact the role of coffee shop customer. Mm. Um, and there's just like an easy script that we know how to perform, right? Um, and, the, and the cashier or barista imp, um, enacts the role of cashier or barista. Right. Um, so we all act the normal way that, that one acts um, when we enact these roles, sort of well, well um, <clears throat> intellectually well-trodden ground by, you know, Social psychologist, right, and right, right. Stuff yeah, and, where if I'm the barista, I say hello. What yeah. would you like? You know, yeah. And it's like, oh, I'd like a, I'd like a large coffee, please. Oh, okay. You know, here you go. Yeah. You know, yeah. And so when we do that, um, we're just enacting these roles, and we're not, um, you know, and it's a good thing that we have these efficient, um, respectful roles to enact. Mm -hmm. um, but in doing so, we don't express much about ourselves as individuals, right? You, mm -hmm. you being the coffee shop customer, you're more or less the same as me um, right. in terms of sort of what we say, how we express ourselves, the sort of movements we make. Um, and so um, you can create a social opening by breaking out of that role and expressing yourself as an individual. You can crack a joke or, um, you know, uh, make a compliment or do, do any number of things sort of that riff on the role or just break out of the role. Mm -hmm. And when you do that, you create a social opening. You allow the barista to break out of her role mm -hmm. and express herself. Um, and uh, so I argue that being awesome is being good at creating these social openings. Mm -hmm. um, suckiness occurs when people don't take them up for no good reason. Gotcha. So imagine if the barista was like, you know, you, you crack a joke and the barista was like, uh, yeah, whatever, like here's your coffee. <laughs> that, would, that would suck. Right, right. right. Um, with the caveat that, um, you know, sort of caffeine addled uh, Minds are running around coffee shops trying to be, you know, witty and smart all the time. So, um, yeah, baristas probably are, you know, they're probably uh, kind of second off the hook. Now. For, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. No, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, and I mean, another thing that I loved about your book is that not only do you illuminate these concepts, but you also kind of talk about that these weren't always in existence. That awesomeness, if anything, is kind of a modern innovation. And in particular, yeah. I loved when you were talking about the high five. And that oh, this yeah. hasn't even existed for more than 50 years or so. That yeah. blew my mind. I could not believe I know, that. Me like, too. I can't yeah. picture life without being able to high five someone. I like, know. <laughs> I don't know what I would do, right? <laughs> yeah, I feel the same way. Um, yeah, like um, there's some really nice research out there uh, by John Mualam, a journalist um, on the high five. And, you know, he notes that um, it's widely credited to uh, this uh, baseball player, Glenn Burke, mm. who, um, who, arguably invented it in, uh, 1977. Oh, and, wow. um, and, uh, you know, I think, I think one of the things I started thinking about when I was thinking about awesomeness and suckiness is that, you know, we, we connect naturally connect awesome that be the thought of being awesome with the high five. Like, so, totally. you know, it's, it's, it's a totally natural thing to be like, awesome, like high yeah. five. Like right? that, that, that book awesome. five, that was awesome. That happened earlier. Exactly. That was totally yeah, exactly. awesome. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, uh, uh, and so, and so, uh, I started thinking about the high five and, you know, I, I learned about, um, Glenn Burke who, um, as I argue in the book was a kind of exemplar of awesomeness. Mm. He, uh, he was really good at creating these social openings. Mm. And one of the, one of the, one of his, uh, inventions in creating social openings was, was, uh, inventing the high five mm. with, uh, with Dusty Baker and um, yeah, it also turns out he was the the first. He's he's recognized by major league major league baseball as the first openly gay baseball player. Wow! So I don't I don't think a lot. Of, I think a lot of people don't don't know that. And I yeah. think that's really a nice piece of our cultural history. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So so what is it about the high five specifically that makes it so emblematic of awesomeness? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I think it's a couple things. Um, one is. Um, I argue, I argue in the book, it's uh, that that the high five has a certain meaning, um, hmm. which a lot of people, if you ask them what the high five means, they'll say something like, "Oh, it's a recognition of excellence," hmm. um, or it's an appreciation of excellence. Like, I see that you're doing something excellent, you know, and I want to recognize that. I high five you. Right. Um, but that actually doesn't make sense of a lot of our practices with the high five. So, hmm. um, so you'll notice in NBA basketball games um, when. Uh, the free thrower misses the free throw. Hmm. Um, what happens after that? Everyone high fives the free thrower. Right. right? That can't be a recognition of excellence. I mean, like, 
you just missed, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, um, so I argue that actually the high five is a, um, a recognition of um, the achievement of mutual appreciation. So mm. it's a kind of symbol of, hey, I recognize you as an individual, like, and you recognize me and like high five. Mm. And um, that seems to be kind of what was going on when the high five was invented. Mm-hmm. Um, Dusty Baker had just hit his 30th home run. And he was one of four or five players who were trying to get to 30 home runs in a season on that team. Right. And um, he was he was like the last one to do it. Hmm. And so he's up to bat, and, and um, Glenn Burke is on deck. And uh, Dusty Baker hits hits the 30th home run, and he approaches home home base, and Glenn Burke is is standing there with his hand way up, up in the air, and Dusty Baker says, "I didn't know what to do. It seemed like he wanted me to hit his hand, so I like <laughs> reached and slapped his hand." Wow. He was beaming with, you know, beaming with a huge smile. And then, uh, and then Glenn Burke goes up to bat and hits his first home run of the season right after Baker hits the 30th. Wow. Yeah, it's amazing. And then, um, well, it's awesome. And then, yeah, uh, there you go. <laughs> maybe it should be about amazing. But, um, <laughs> but, uh, but he, uh, when, when Burke comes around to home base after hitting his first major league home, home run, Baker's standing there with his hand up in the air, like, cool. you know, ready for the high five. So, right. um, that's that's an awesome you know that's a that's an awesome moment a kind of breaking out of a, a, the normal way of of sort of recognizing people and um yeah. and actually inventing a new way to do it um, mm. yeah yeah I love that and yeah. um and so another thing that I really liked in the book is that you go into the specifics of the different ways that we can suck and the different ways that we can be awesome and, right uh, yeah there's a whole taxonomy oh oh I've got it I've got yeah. a copy oh. right here hey, you know, yeah that. so. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah. I mean, so, so looking through this stuff, um, there were a, a couple that really, um, that I thought you just totally nailed in the book in yeah. particular. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and one that I was hoping to ask you about was, um, was the fake ass person and, oh, yeah. um, and, and the, and the yeah. two subcategories of uh, self-effacer and douchebag. Oh and, yeah. Um, and I, yeah. and I just thought you did such a great job of illuminating what those are and why they kind of suck. So yeah. Could you oh, just yeah. tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so that's under the category that I define as non-starter. Mm. So, um, so there's there's the idea of the social opening, right? You can mm. create one, in which case you're on the awesome side of things. Right. You can take one up, in which case you're also on the awesome side of things because awesomeness takes two to tango, right? Mm-hmm. If someone creates a social opening, someone has to be down uh, to take it up. Right. And so downness is like this important category. Um, and you can be, um, you know, you can be game enthusiastically down or Mm -hmm. you can be chill, um, or you can be up. Right. So those are the, those are the, those are the ways of sort of creating or taking up. Then you can, um, you can opt out or decline. Mm -hmm. Uh, You can do it by being whack or simply sucky, Mm. uh, or you can take one up and, um, and then kind of fail because a lot of, um, a lot of social openings are extended and dynamic interactions. Mm -hmm. And so you might take one up, but then kind of, as I argue in the book, you might underperform or overperform or just be kind of a bore. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But then there's this like last category of, of the non-starter. So Mm -hmm. the non-starter is someone with whom just for some constitutive reason, you can't, uh, you can't, uh, create social openings with them. Mm. Um, so one non-starter is like the asshole, right? Yeah who places himself above everyone in the social order. Mm-hmm. And so if you were to cr- try to create a social opening, the asshole would just say like, you know, uh, I may or may not take it up. Like it's a privilege to you if I do. Right. Right. Um, so they're kind of a non-starter. They're not even going to play this, this, um, this, they can't even, as it were, enter the ethics of awesomeness. They can't right. get into that game. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other category uh, I talk about there is, um, is, uh, the, uh, well, the fake ass person, um, mm-hmm. So there's someone who seems to take up the social opening, mm-hmm. but who, um, so they they seem to be presenting their individuality in mm-hmm. response to expressive individuality that they're confronted with. Right. But in fact, they're fake, right? They're faking it. They're not actually presenting who they are. So, um, this, this kind of, this, the relation of mutual appreciation, what I call the co personhood mm-hmm. uh, can't, can't be formed, right? Yeah. Because, um, because although it seems like they are, they're actually presenting a fake, a fake persona. Right. And so, right. And then so there, so I talk about a couple categories. There's the douchebag, the tool, um, 
actually tool is not in the taxonomy, but I talk about tools in the, right. in the thing a little bit. And uh, the selfie facer. Um, yeah, and the selfie facer is just a type of fake ass person who um, who might seem to be game or down mm-hmm. uh, with respect to social openings, but who always kind of deflects or never really commits to a certain a certain persona, right? Yeah. They're always kind of like being ironic or um, saying things and then disavowing them. Yeah, um, yeah. And so it's hard to create the relation of co-personhood, uh, create awesomeness with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, yeah, it seems like there's a real authenticity that is lacking there if it's always about yeah. irony and sarcasm and, and as you yeah. say, kind of like deflecting sincerity away from them. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I encounter people like that all the time and I just can't yeah. stand it. So, so I really right. appreciate so that. Yeah. And just to be clear, it's not that ironic people suck. Like mm. you can have an ironic sort of disposition or whatever. Sure. Um, it's more that, um, it's, 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 and that, but that's clear that they're an ironic person, right? Mm-hmm. It's, uh, the selfie facer is someone who never makes it clear whether they're ironic or not. Or okay. Yeah, that's or fair. Thing. So you're just kind of like, I just don't know what to, <laughs> right. what right, to right. do with you, um, mm-hmm. how to, how to continue this, this social opening yeah. in a productive way. Yeah. And then, um, well, the douchebag gets, gets a kind of complex analysis, um, <laughs> in, in, in the book, but, uh, but yeah, I argue that the douchebag is, is also a kind of fake ass person. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah well, that's, that's, that's great. You know, I, I mean, I, again, I mean, reading through this, I felt like I had like a whole new understanding of, of my own social life. So that was, that yeah, was really good. helpful. That was, that was the hope, you know, yeah. I hope, I hope yeah. that people read this and, um, at least for the, at the very least, you know, use the structure I I've invented to kind of, um, yeah, just sort of put a different lens on their social life just to see right. maybe like. Wow, does that illuminate anything about about who I am or yeah, yeah, yeah. My friend, about my friends or who I've had friendships with in the past? And, right, right. Uh, um, and then I was also hoping to then you know zoom in a little bit on a couple of ways of being awesome. Um, so, yeah. so for example, I, I loved how you talked about that. Uh, dogs are like the paragon <laughs> of gameness. You know, yeah, like yeah. they're not just down; <laughs> like they are game. Right, so, right, yeah, yeah, could yeah. you explain that a little bit? Oh yeah, that's that's fun. Um, yeah, so the book. I mean, one thing you might note about the book is is, is that it's got um, it's really written with a, a sense of humor. Hmm. Um, you know, it's it's philosophy for a general audience. So I wanted it to be kind of fun and engaging, mm-hmm. and um, and uh, so so like you know, in, in that spirit, I, I say you know, the advice for being game is to think like a dog, um, <laughs> right? Because dogs were were you know, dogs don't just want to go for a walk. They like are game for a walk they <laughs> want to go for, you know they just want to like right they're not just like yeah i guess i'll just take a ride in this car they're like the car like, I'm gonna head out the window, like ah. yeah um, yeah and so uh so just in, in in this sort of spirit of humor i was just thinking um yeah like being game um when someone creates a social opening mm-hmm. the game person is enthusiastically down mm-hmm. to take it up so they they re- as it were they recognize this offering of expressive individuality and they're like yeah I'm I'm right there with you I'm in co personhood is is formed and what's so what's so great about being game in the ethics of awesomeness is um, that that kind of enthusiasm tends to spread um, to other people and, right. and encourage them to be down mm-hmm. at the very least down if not game themselves or chill right right, right. Um, and it it tends to highlight sort of um, it, it tends to draw our attention to features of the social opening that make it worth taking up. And mm-hmm. so the, if, if, even if you're d- disposed to be kind of sucky, like <laughs> people who are game might help you sort of, you know, snap out of that a little bit and, and see, Oh no, yeah, this is, this is something I, I want to, you know, engage with. Right, 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 right. And, and then you also mentioned in the book that, and correct me if I'm wrong here, but I seem to remember that if you are, if you're game, you know, if you're always enthusiastically down to take up other people's, you know, social openings that they create, but then you also create your own social openings, then, th- yeah. then you could consider to, you would be, you, you rock, right? Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. Is, yeah. is that, did I get that right? Could you explain that? Yeah. A little yeah. Bit? yeah, totally. Um, yeah. So, um, I, I, I mentioned two other sort of ways of combining awesomeness and downness. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, being, you know, rocking is like, um, is someone who's just like, uh, you know, an expert in the ethics of, of awesomeness in terms mm-hmm. of they're able to create social openings mm-hmm. and, um, and they're always sort of down or uh, game to, to take them up when, um, 
when they're when, so as it were they sort of have you know people who rock just kind of have awesomeness like yeah on the tip of the tongue um, so this yeah. is someone so this is like someone who invites people over to dinner but then also you know is like more than willing to go to somebody else's dinner party or whatever yeah, can you exactly. give me some examples yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, that's that's a great that's a great example, right? Okay. So someone who someone who um, is really good at, um, yeah, they, uh, you know, um, they might like uh, be like one of the, you know, I don't know, uh, most awesome members of of like a of a party. They like bring great, um, they they bring great food for people, or they they make fun drinks or mm-hmm. whatever. Uh, they play great music or have good ideas for playing games and hanging out. Mm-hmm. Um, but then they 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 aren't just game they're they're also great at doing that themselves right so they'll throw great parties or like make a great dinner for for friends and stuff like that right so, right right gotcha yeah. gotcha yeah. good yeah and um you know and one one thing that I wanted to ask you about too throughout this book I was um in the back of my mind I sort of had a question that I've been wondering about for some time even before I came across this book which yeah. is that um you know what is it that makes someone a badass Right. Uh-huh. Like, like, you know, like that's a question yeah. I've been thinking about a lot because a lot of like yeah. my role models and the people that I look up to are, I mean, some of them are academics, some of them are athletes uh-huh. and like everyone yeah. in between. And I consider almost all of them to be totally badass. I just can't yeah, quite yeah. figure out <laughs> what that means. Right. So, yeah. so in yeah. your mind, you know, is there, does badassery fall under the ethics of uh, awesomeness? Like, is there a relationship yeah. there? What, like, what do you think? That's a cool question. Um, <clears throat> I wonder, I mean, my intuition is that, um, bad, so, so, so all the categories I define in the book are, um, as it were, social categories, right? Mm -hmm. So they, they're essentially, uh, interpersonal modes of existence or ways of being. So like, you know, um, being down, being game, being chill, even rocking and ruling. Mm -hmm. That's not just about like owning shit. It's like in your life, you know, it's like about the way you, uh, exist socially, mm-hmm, right. Mm-hmm. With other people. Um, and so that's one of the main points of the book is to argue that awesomeness is about creating certain, a certain kind of community mm, nice. through your expressiveness as an individual. Mm-hmm. I think my thought with badassery is that like the badass just like, you know, owns shit, right? That's the, <laughs> like, they just like what they choose to do with their life. Like they do it with like expertise and confidence and, um, and they're just impressive yeah. uh, in, th- in that respect. Um, mm-hmm. And so that, my, anyway, my sense is that badassery is is not a social, uh, mm-hmm. like the so like you could be badass socially, mm-hmm. in which case you might be awesome. Right. But I think badassery in general is is um, more a matter of just uh, yeah, like really tackling sort of what you set out to do with your life and, yeah. and doing it with confidence and and a kind of presentational verve. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think yeah. that makes a lot of sense. And and I also, you know, to me, badass also entails a certain degree of like uh like risk tolerance or or some degree of like throwing caution to the wind and being oh, like, good. You know, I yeah. don't care what anybody says, I'm gonna do this yeah. thing. And then they uh, do it like really well, you know. So yeah. so I agree that it seems like yeah. it's much less of a social concept than awesomeness yeah. is. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. but I still, I still think it's a complex one. So if yeah, you, uh, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. if you decide to, you know, write yeah. a book on this, I will be like your first buyer for sure. <laughs> and we'll do another, well, maybe, interview. uh, maybe I'll include it in my next book, which is about, um, the idea that you only live once. Oh, um, cool. Okay. Yeah. And so people, people connect the idea that you only live once or like carpe diem. Yeah. Um, or like YOLO, you know, yeah. um, <laughs> with, uh, with the idea that you should be adventurous or risky. Hmm. Right? And so you should throw caution to the wind and like, just be, be a badass. Like you only right. live once. Right, right. Um, and, uh, but the thought like philosophically, it's, it's actually quite interesting because it's not clear what the connection is between having only one life and living in any particular way. Hmm. So you might think if you live only once, you should not be adventurous or risky. You should preserve your life and be careful. <laughs> like, right. Stay inside. Total, like, <laughs> yeah. Stay inside. Like, <laughs> Be really healthy, like germophobic, yeah. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. like watch out. Right. Um, uh, there's a funny uh, SNL skit uh, Andy Samberg did about about you only live once, and oh, it's like I've, I think I've seen this. Like, like yeah, it's like you, you ought to look out. Yeah, yes, yes, Instead exactly. Alone, like, you ought to look out. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's so, great. So, uh, so there's a kind of philosophical case to be made that connects the thought of our one and only life with the thought of being adventurous and risky and sort of 
mm-hmm. putting ourselves out there. Mm-hmm. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When does this book come out, by the way? Uh, I don't know. It'll Gotta... probably be a little bit, right? Yeah. All right, yeah. all right. I'll be patient. I'll be patient. <laughs> all right, well, um, well, I just had a... I'm presenting it in New York, probably. Oh, you are? Just... Yeah, yeah, oh, good. Well, I mean, I'll be around. So, so okay, definitely cool. let me know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I will. I will. Good, 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 good. Um, so I just had a couple last questions for you. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I guess the first one being, this is kind of a two-part question. Um, very simply, how can we be more awesome people? And, and or, or as you kind of clarify at the end of the book, maybe it's less about being awesome and more about doing more awesome things, right? Right. Awesome. Awesomizing. Yes. So how, right. can, we, how can we do that? <laughs> yeah, good. Um, I mean, so uh, there's there's a lot I say in the book about um, how to be, well, how to be fluent in the ethics of awesomeness, mm-hmm. right? So there's a kind of um, there's a, a bunch of advice I give about um, you know managing suckiness and and mm-hmm. and sort of tackling um, being down, game chill, rocking, ruling, etc. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, I think you know one one major thing is to um, just start attending to the ways in which um, you're enacting social roles mm. um, and then seeing sort of noticing when you're doing that, but then like starting to be attentive to how you can break out of them mm. in sort of, in sort of virtuous ways that can create these social openings. Yeah, yeah. It's not easy, right? You can really fail at it and <laughs> we can be insensitive and we can be, you know, awkward and, and just like actually quite rude and yep. offensive even. Um, but, um, so, so it's a kind of skill that you, that you have to develop. And, Mm -hmm. um, and so some of the, so attending to, attending to the role side of your life versus the like expressive side, um, is one, one thing to sort of focus on. But another thing is, you know, we can just be really like dismissive of people when we think about people in stereotypes or Mm -hmm. uh, with prejudice or, um, any kind of way of, of, you know, seeing a mere appearance of someone and then just sort of like dismissing them as like whatever, like right. not my type of person. Right? Yeah, yeah. But uh, we would be way more awesome if we if we just did that less and uh, instead of dismissing people, sort of attending to the ways in which their individuality is is uh, interesting or worthy of sort of um, engagement and interaction and um, and uh, or you know, and it can be. It doesn't have to be too complicated, right? So uh, an acquaintance, I mentioned this in the book, but an acquaintance was uh, at the airport and and uh, an airport uh, employee was just like, you know, really owning shit, like being a badass <laughs> nice. at their job and, uh, you know, handling luggage, dealing with irritated passengers and stuff like that. And, mm-hmm. and uh, sort of in the spirit of awesomeness, this person just went up to the, to the, to the worker and said, hey, you know, you're doing a you're doing an awesome job. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. and, and their response was to turn around, give them a high five and just go right, right back to work. That's Um, great. That's great. That's awesome. Awesome. Right. Yeah. (laughs) You know, so it's looking, looking for, you know, and that's a, that's a simple opportunity, right? Just going out of your way a little bit. Like you're not just the standard, uh, you know, um, airline passenger, like you just break out of that, just that little bit. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm. And that creates, that creates more awesomeness. So, so it doesn't have to be hard. It can be kind of easy and one off and yeah. 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 No, no, I I totally dig that. And, and, you know, that kind of feeds perfectly into this last question that I had, um, which is that, you know, so if we, you know, why do you think that, um, that the world needs more awesomeness right now? Because there are so many other words that we could throw out there like, Oh, we should be more generous and we should be more kind and it's not that that's not true but you know why do you think that the world needs more awesomeness specifically yeah yeah so um that's great um so i think that i mean it's actually complicated i could talk about this for a long time because (laughs) well i I talk about it in chapter um what is it chapter five um is it chapter five your book i don't know (laughs) (laughs) um in chapter sorry yeah in chapter five in the origins of awesome Mm. um but i argue that um you know, we create awesomeness is about creating these um, communities of mutually appreciative individuals. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, one of the things we're struggling with right now as a society is um, a kind of cultural problem that emerged after the cultural and political and legal revolutions of the 60s mm-hmm. that we're still trying to work through, where, um, you know, it became a cultural priority to. Um, to allow people to um, be whatever individual they want to be, right? Mm-hmm. So, or individualism in the sense of um, 
emphasizing the importance of the individual, mm-hmm. um, started to sort of, um, uh, you know, shape culture and, and law in, in, in a more dramatic um, way. Right. And as a result, and you know, there's a lot of good, there's a lot of good research on this. Um, it, it looks like a lot of traditional forms of community sort of fell away as people mm. were focusing on individuals. People focus less on, you know, community building, um, like, like religious communities and yeah. you know, social clubs, et cetera. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, stuff like that. And, um, and I think that, but I think that, you know, part of, our lives are sort of deep. We have these deep desires to be, we do want to develop our style and be individuals and, Mm -hmm. but we also really deeply want to be part of a community, right? Mm -hmm. We want to sort of feel like we belong and, um, um, feel like we're loved and appreciated as a, as a part of a community. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. But these, these desires kind of are intention because if you're too much of an individual, Mm -hmm. then you won't be intelligible to the community or you're, you're going to seem whack or yeah. <laughs> odor or some of the categories I talk about in the book. Right. Uh, but if you're too deferential to the community, mm-hmm. uh, too willing to kind of just blend in, mm-hmm. um, then, uh, then you're going to come off as kind of basic or a bore. Yeah. 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 Uh, you won't have that. You won't sort of strike the right stylistic key, uh, key um, mm-hmm. for, for the ethics of awesomeness. And um, so what I argue in the book is that um, we have this ideal, uh, we, we care about this ideal of being awesome because we sort of appreciate that the result of being awesome and someone being game or down is what I call this co-person community, this community of mm. individuals mm. who are appreciating one another's individuality. Mm-hmm. And not it's not a community where we all have to share the same values or we all have to be Christian or we all have to be, you know, like support a certain political candidate or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's actually a kind of, um, a more sort of forgiving and appreciative community. Um, mm. And I think that uh, for a society like ours that wants to emphasize, um, you know, the free cultivation of individuality, we also have to find ways to create community because it's also, that's also something we really, we really need. I think we suffer when, when we don't have um, good communities in our lives. I mean, mm-hmm. maybe not everyone, but I think it's a general fact about yeah. uh, human psychology. And, um, and so I think we see in awesomeness a kind of a promising ideal that, um, you know, beyond just being generous and kind and, and, and thoughtful and stuff actually promises to reconcile these, these deep desires we have in a way that, um, you know, maybe would be great for our, for the future of our, our society. Yeah, no, I, I think that's perfect, man. Um, yeah. I mean, there, there was, there was, um, one phrase actually from the book. I thought that that encapsulated that perfectly. I think you said mm. awesomeness allows us to stand out, but stand together. And yeah. Yeah. I thought that was like yeah. perfect. Cool. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> yeah. so on that note, um, I think yeah. that's, that seems like a pretty, pretty good way to close it out. So, um, so once again, the book is on being awesome, a unified yeah. theory of how not to suck. Um, Nick Riggle, thank you again for joining me. Thanks so much, Jeremy. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. Same here.